I would have probably died uh, playing that role. I mean, I, 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 even the thought of it now upsets me. Well, Rollin was a man of many faces. He was a sleight of hand expert. He was, he was a, a showman, and uh, Bruce Geller knew me. Uh, he used to come to my acting classes that I used to teach, and that was an interesting class with Jack Nicholson and Harry Dean Stanton and people like that, uh, Shirley Knight, and uh, he used to see me kid around uh, with dialects and, and stuff, and, and he basically, the first script I got was a motion picture, uh, very much like a French movie called Rififi, where we were bad guys pulling off a caper, and he couldn't get it made as a movie. So he decided to turn us into good guys, and uh, my original character was called Martin Land, and I said, uh, you know, Bruce, I don't want that. I mean, Martin, you know. So he, he was before computers, obviously, and so the same number of typespaces, uh, Rollin Hand fit into that, and uh, so we changed. First it was Martin Hand, and then it was Rollin Hand, and. Uh, I was only going to do uh, the pilot as a guest star because I, I'd been offered a high chaper uh, uh, several other series which I turned down, and had no intention of doing a series at that point. I had also turned down Star Trek, so uh, anyway, when the pilot was shown, uh, Bill Paley apparently said, "I want that guy on the show all the time," so I signed a deal as a guest star because I. I had the ability to leave the show with two weeks' notice at any time, so I knew if they put me in the main titles, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I created a new kind of billing, which had never been done before, called Special Appearance by Martin Landau, and that that was my billing. Uh, when Stephen Hill, the first year, uh, plopped those pictures down, it said Special Appearance by Martin Landau, or guest, Special Guest Appearance by, something to that effect. and. Uh, so I did, I wound up doing 26 out of 28 shows the first season because I was having such a good time. And then the second year I signed a contract for one year and the third year as well uh, and was put into the main titles. So there was an evolution to that and uh, uh, I wound up having fun with my, and my ex-wife was on the show as Cinnamon Carter, so it was all in the family, so to speak. Well, there's no question about that. You know, I mean, it was early days of color. I mean, I say early days, and most of the sets in the country were black and white. And our opening segment was a, a black and white sequence in color, uh, which most people didn't know existed. Uh, the apartment scene, when the emissions were given out, the walls were white, the suits and jackets and uh, ties and Barbara's dress were always black, silver, or gray. And the only color in the sequences were a, a touch of wood and the skin tones of the actors. So stylistically, uh, we did a, a black and white sequence in color as a, a, a style choice, which most Americans did not appreciate because the whole show is in black and white as far as they was concerned. But Bruce, uh, like David Dortort, who shot uh, Bonanza in color, right off the bat, way before there were color sets all over, uh, where, you know, he did High Chaparral and uh, Bonanza in color uh, with the idea of reruns and, and the future, and Bruce did the same thing. It insisted in a way that you watch the whole show. In fact, Lucille Ball, who put the show on at Desiglu when we first went on the air, I, I remember a, a conversation I had with her. She said, I don't, I don't understand the show. And she was married to Gary Morton, who was a friend of mine, who was her husband at that time. She'd already divorced uh, Desi and was remarried, uh, newly. And uh, I said, well, do you watch it? I mean, do you go to the ladies' room or do you answer the phone? Or? She said, yeah, why? I said, you can't do that with the show. I said, and I, and I think if it stays on the air, uh, the sponsors will be happy because people won't leave. They'll watch the commercials, which they did. 
I mean, they did some demographic study and found that uh, of all the shows on the air, uh, at the commercial breaks, Mission Impossible viewers uh, sat still so as not to miss the next piece. And so I said, I said, you know, why don't you just watch one through without <laughs> bouncing around the room? And uh, about six months later, I, I, she said to me, I understand it now. I said, it's because you probably stay sick. And she says, yeah. Uh, Lucy wanted to sell the studio. And so she decided to put some shows on. The only thing on the air was the Lucy show, her show. And then she, the rest of the things on, on the lot with the, the desert lots were, were four wall shows. Uh, Hogan's Heroes and Ben Casey and those shows, just renting space. So she said, if I can get some shows on the air, I can, the studio will be worth more money. And so she got Star Trek on and Mission on the same year. Star Trek on NBC and Mission on CBS. And that uh, helped. Uh, the cachet as such. You, you began to realize the failings of a character. I played the character and you know obviously we, we win at the end. I mean mission accomplished, not mission impossible. The impossible mission is, is a suggestion at the top of the show. The end of the show the good guys win, the bad guys lose and the ideal mission was our getting in and getting out without anyone ever knowing we were there. That was an ideal mission because we played mind games and it wasn't an action adventure show at all. It was a puzzle. Well, you got to, I, I played the character uh, as a human being. I mean, he, when he was caught, he was stuck and frightened and had to figure things out. Uh, you know, I didn't play him as a Superman. I played him as a guy who, who was in over his head always and always checking out whether he was, you know, in the pilot episode, I not only played the dictator, but we kidnap him, and I play the I, I pretend to be the dictator and play the real dictator. And if you look at that episode, as the real dictator, I'm completely in charge of what I'm doing. And as the Rollin playing the dictator, he's he's not he's not he's making sure, part of what he's looking at is am I getting through? Is this guy buying this? Uh, because I'm, otherwise I'm dead. Uh, so th those elements were things I always injected into the character that made him vulnerable and, and uh, flawed, but good at what he does. But how good is that? And in what kind of a, a situation and circumstance? And I think one of the reasons the character took hold was because I, I I made him vulnerable. I made him uh, possibly in trouble more more often than not, and and so uh, and in the relationship with Barbara, we had a, a and I was aware that nothing was going to happen on that show between you know accepting uh, my connection to her was different than my connection, let's say, to Greg Morris. I mean there was. There was always some awareness of, of the sensuality, hyphen sexuality, of when we worked together. There was, and I, I injected that as well, you know, a slight flirtation of this and that, you know, a little more on that level than when I dealt with uh, 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 either Peter Graves or Stephen Hill in the first year, or, or Pete Lupus. I mean, and I had individual choices that I made with relation to each of those characters. And I related to them, and this is all subtle stuff, but uh, the average viewer would not notice as much as, uh, unless you watch the show a lot, you would see that my character related to different people differently. Uh, subtly, because it wasn't, you know, uh, it's not, uh, a character-driven show in, in a traditional sense, so it is a character-driven show. We're all experts in certain areas, and we're called on to exhibit our expertise, and uh, other lives are at stake continually. So uh, our our team and our camaraderie uh, is something that was, the fact that we liked each other as actors also kind of bled into the reality of the show. 
I mean, uh, guest actors love working on the show because we welcomed them and 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 they had a good time, and and that th those elements are, are ones that you know. Uh, <laughs> if I didn't talk about them, no one would understand them entirely. But they are subtle things that do people do kinesthetically react to and understand. Not here, but here. <coughs> but that's what good acting is about. It's about uh, connecting and, and humanizing a character. No one tries to cry, no one tries to laugh, only bad actors. No one plays drunk, only bad actors. Drunks want another drink. Anyway, it was like doing an anthology series in a series. I mean, it was it was basically like you know doing Twilight Zone every week in the sense that you played a, you were yourself to start with, and then you dressed up and played other characters, older, younger, different dialects, you know, German. Ach so, you know, you play a German, and then next week a Russian, a Russian fellow who talks like this, or gangster, you know, hey Charlie, you know, you never know what the heck you're going to be singing and how you're going to say it, you know what I mean? So uh, it gave you a kind of field day as an actor. Uh, uh, it was like being a one-man rep company, uh, particularly my character. I mean, who, who was. By the way, I'm, let me. <laughs> you th I, I always wanted to take a mask off and have the same face underneath. Yeah, it became part of the parlance and part of, and people were always kind of doing that when they met me. They said, "Is that really you?" You know, and and because I had a particular way of appealing it, I didn't do that. I I sort of lifted it from the side, and and uh, the show was fun. We had a good time. We liked each other. The actors really enjoyed each other, and 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 each script that came was, you know, as you say, a, a completely different adventure. And we started out as our characters, you know, wearing nice clothes and then turned into whatever we needed to turn into. I mean, you know, uh, I played older, younger, blonde, uh, Martin Bormann, Adolf Hitler. I mean, I played an, an astonishing a plethora of, of, of characters on that show and, and all kinds of, you know, dialects of, you know, all, it was a, a field day, actually a, very, a field day. I had a very good time, you know. I enjoyed it immensely. Well, no, the the, the Washington, uh, the Washington uh, uh, alphabet soup would call Bruce Geller and say, "Watch, how do you know about that? Washington, not not so much Russia. The Russian guys, you know, we we were never. It was never Russia. It was Slavovia or Kapronge. That's right." A guy came to visit us one day. He was a, a journalist from Pravda, which was a fairly big newspaper run by the government in Moscow, but based in New York. He was a New York correspondent. And he said, very embarrassing, Mr. Lendo. Uh, my son, uh, Sunday nights, I let him stay up late to watch your show. He, but he says, uh, hi, Pop, how come all the bad guys talk like you? So that's an actual story, and uh, we, though we were never, it was never Russia, it was always some fictional place, and, the, and if you noticed, uh, the languages were not actual iron country languages, you know, poly, pol it was not, it, it never police, it was policia, or polizia, or police, you know, it, 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 it was recognizably uh, wrongly spelled, and uh, you know, cabaret was spelled improperly, or circus had the wrong. You know, everything looked like an eye chart. Uh, it was, uh, <laughs> but but, and uh, we never went anywhere either. I mean, we we went to Pasadena City Hall, or uh, the the furthest. We went to the desert one time to do a western show. 
but we went to Malibu Lake, and, and I mean, we never left Los Angeles, and and we were you know, basically all over the world on that show, and never anywhere. So I mean, to think that we shot that entire series in these exotic foreign countries, uh, never leaving Los Angeles, ever, excepting for the desert, I mean, and and a couple of lakes that were a little bit further away, but everything was. Uh, was local, and uh, but people believed that we were in, in you know, in Monte Carlo. In uh, we very carefully chose locations that were uh, consistent with, you know, we have, you have a lot of red tile roofs and and stuff which you find in the south of France or the south of Spain, and and palm trees, and so there was a, a, an exotic aspect to the show. I mean, people thought we traveled everywhere. Nowhere. Well, we had 50 more setups than any other hour show on the year. The average hour show in those days took six days to shoot. We took seven. Uh, it was a rarity. Today, uh, shows take eight or nine going in, hour shows. I don't know why, but they do. Uh, we did a lot of work in a very short amount of time. And we, we were the only show shooting seven days on an hour show, seven working days as such. Uh, every other show, uh, hour show was a six day show. And uh, now there's no show that shoots under eight, an hour show. It was very cinematic. I mean, cinema. Uh, a lot of the other shows are radio shows with uh, people in front of the camera. Uh, a lot of talk, uh, a lot of, uh, well, you know, characters saying a lot of things about things, exposition, and, and not a lot happening. Uh, good dialogue uh, is, I mean, basically characters only, good dialogue is what a, a, a character is willing to share with another character or willing to reveal to another character. The 90% he or she isn't is what I do for a living. People only say what they want to be heard. And in much of the writing today, you get two doctors in a hallway discussing something that they would have learned in Anatomy 101. You know, these are two, sir, I wouldn't let them take out an ingrown hair from me. I mean, they're talking to the audience, they're not talking to each other. And there's an inordinate amount of that. As a result, writing has decreased, I mean, good writing, to a bunch of explanations. Characters saying things that they'd never say to each other. Saying that each other's names a dozen and a half times. Hi, Jack. I mean, Jack, let me tell you this, Jack. Uh, a funny thing happened the other day, Jack. Uh, I was on my way to such and such, and then, uh, are you listening, Jack? I mean, I don't mention uh, other people's names at all in a conversation if I know them well. Uh, that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I was offered that. It was a character without emotion. I, I mean, I knew it was going to be, uh, if it was a hit, yeah, it was a guy with pointy ears who was ahead, who was on top of everything. I mean, it's, it's what people in the 60s were striving for, to be, you know, uh, absolutely aware of anything and everything going on and not uh, exasperated by it, so to speak. And, and uh, it was the antithesis of why I became an actor. I mean, I, to play a character that, that Lenny was better suited for, frankly. He's a guy who talks in a monotone, who never gets excited, and never get, has any guilt, never has any fear, never never is affected on a visceral level. Uh, who wants to do that? I mean, I, it's like sun, somnambulating. Uh, it's it's. I, I would go crazy doing that. I would go insane. I was offered a character that is the antithesis of that. He's everything. He gets excited. He screams. He yells. He cries. He, because he's allowed to. So I, I, it would have been torturous. I mean, I, I, I would have probably died 
uh, playing that role. I mean, I, 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 even the thought of it now upsets me. <laughs> well, we were an accident and blown out of orbit. Uh, when we left the Earth's orbit, there were tidal waves and all kinds of disaster on Earth because the moon's effect on the Earth is enormous in terms of tides, in terms of uh, a lot of things. Uh, here we are on the moon hurtling through space and not in control of where we're going. 300 people looking for a compatible planet to settle on because though we had hydroponic units and so on, we, we didn't have enough resources on the moon base to procreate, which meant you know, the end of humanity as we knew it because we're, we're not sure that any would live on the earth without the moon present. So all of that, so yes, it was a different kind of show, it's a long answer, but different in the sense that it, it had um, a, a contemporary feel. We weren't doing anything outrageous. Star Trek, I mean, it could go anywhere. There were thousands of years in, in the future, and they could go places and do things. We could, you know, they could dissolve and show up in another place. We couldn't do any of those things. And we were barely surviving. Our whole uh, desire was to, and we had no clue as to what was going on on Earth, whether the hum, hum, there was any, uh, with the last 300 people extant in the universe, as we know it. Uh, so it had those elements, which was a, which is a very different. And, and we took a beating because of you know Star Trek uh, aficionados, but our show we never intended to compete with Star Trek or compare ourselves. It's a different reality, and and we were people brought up in this century or the previous century. I mean, as such. My character was born in, you know, in the, in the uh, well, that's 1999, so he was brought up uh, in the, he was born in the 60s, uh, so 70, uh, 50s probably. <coughs> I used to know that information at the tip of my tongue, but it's been a while. But my character, you know, was born in the latter half of the 20th century. So what he learned was what people growing up at that time learned. And, and he's, he's an astrophysicist and, and, a, and a pilot and test pilot. He's, you know, he, he knows what he's doing, but he's also full of doubt because, I mean, it's uncharted territory and <coughs> excuse me, uh, decisions, uh, any kind of unilateral decisions ultimately are, 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 you know, the future of mankind could be in his hands from all he knows. And uh, there's no precedence for anything that happens. And that's a very different take uh, than, let's say, a Star Trek. In a feature film, if you do three pages a day and, and on a fairly well-budgeted uh, uh, movie, that's a lot. Uh, on television, you have to do 10 pages a day. And uh, that's two and a half times. Uh, the, the output. So, uh, you, you know, you've got, well, in my day it was 10 pages a day. Uh, it's now a little less actually, but not too much less. Uh, you know, you can spend, in a feature film, you can spend a whole day and a half on one page of stuff if it's complicated. And uh, there's a difference. but. It's it's just you know I prefer film work only because I have a chance to play more. Uh, when I say that, I mean you know if you're doing a prescribed television show, you are the guest, and everything else is kind of rooted in 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 history, and and the parameters are skinnier. Uh, not necessarily on, on a show like Entourage because, I mean, that character, I had a chance to play with that guy and uh, only because he, he, there was a nice arc to it. I mean, you think the guy's missing a few cylinders and ultimately you realize that he outsmarts Jeremy Piven's character and gets him fired. Uh, 
so uh, there was a place to go there and and I I had a I had a lot of fun working with those kids you know but there's a limitation you know I've never approached any role I've ever played in the same way I've never met two people who are alike in life similar but never exactly alike and within the context of any piece of material uh, that character just by the very nature of telling that particular story has to be different than anyone else I've ever played. He has to come from a different place, he has to, uh, by necessity, uh, he has different profession possibly, he has a different outlook on life, he has different predilections, he, he's attracted to different things, and all of those things make up a character. He, subdues other things, he's willing to reveal other things, uh, and all of that complication creates a human being that hopefully an audience will connect to and say, oh, I know that feeling, I know that, oh yeah, oh yeah. And, and that's, that visceral connection is, is, you know, happens out of people identifying and recognizing a character and taking the trip with him. But my, my job is always to fill that space that the writer wants me to fill and in telling that story, not sticking out or not being a, apart from it, but a part of it. People spend most of their adult life putting armor on and hiding what they really feel. An actor needs to touch all of those things. He needs to be able to express that stuff and then do what that character would do to hold it down. And, and how a character hides his feelings tells us who he is, not how he shows his feelings. No one shows their feelings except bad actors. And I see a lot of that. And a lot of those actors are considered good actors. And they're, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, I mean, I run the acting sessions at the actor's studio I have for years. And I've taught acting, my, you know, as you mentioned, you know, with very, a lot of good people. If I didn't do what I was telling them to do all these years, no one would stick around. So, I mean, I have to, part of it, my desire to teach, we call it moderating at the studio, is also to keep me in line. And, and, and it doesn't allow me to get lazy because if I'm telling you to do something and I'm not doing it, hey, hey, I better be an example of what I'm telling you to do. And I'm talking to very talented actors who got into the actor's studio through a series of auditions. Dustin Hoffman will tell you we auditioned nine times to get into the studio. Uh, Geraldine Page, six times to get in. Uh, I, I think uh, Gene Hackman did it four times before we got in. I mean, uh, not easy to get in. You're a life member if you get in. So what I'm basically saying is, I run the acting sessions I have for years, and I better be an example of what I'm talking about. Because, I, I mean, never was a time that I wasn't acting while I was doing this. So it makes me pay attention, and there's something good in that. You know, I, I hear actors, older actors, often say, well, I just phone it in. Well, that's not. I think of each role I play as, an, as a new adventure, as a new journey, a new what can I do with this guy and what can I, how can I make him interesting and how can I enhance the script? How can I better tell the story or add to that element, fill that space as, as, as well as I can possibly do that? Well, uh, certain actors have problems. Uh, so an actor can have a problem with intimacy. Most American men have problems with intimacy. So, I mean, because they're actors, it doesn't mean that that's absolved. Uh, love scenes, I mean, where you're really comfortable with a member of the opposite sex. I mean, uh, hypothetically, uh, you, you walk onto a movie set and you meet in makeup the gal who's your wife of five years and you just meet her, and and you're in uh, uh, your living room set is working that day, which means the scene where you first move into that house, and you're happy, and then uh, in the middle of the script, the scene where a couple of arguments start happening, 
And then the scene where you break up and have a violent fight, and then the scene at the end of the movie where you get back together. And all of those are being shot in the f either one day or two days. And you've just met this actress. And uh, there are certain things one has to do to convince an audience that, you know, I mean, if, if you live with somebody and you hear the tone of their voice and you're reading a book, you know what's going on without having to see that person. Whoops. You know, uh, there are those kinds of familiar things that occur after a five-year relationship that one has to make choices with relation to to create that reality for an audience. It's all of that stuff. I mean, acting is very complicated. And film acting is harder, in a sense, than theater acting. You don't have to do it once a night. Uh, uh, on the stage, I mean, you can, which is still, you know, but it's in progression, and you're on, on film, as I say, on, on an ordinary, any scene, you may have to shoot it anywhere from 15 to 20 times, just in terms of master shot, 50-50, two or three of those, over the shoulders, both ways, a close-up with a 50 millimeter lens, a choker, you wind up adding those up, and those are the good takes without the bumps, or the, the crab dolly bumps, or the, the boom got into the shot, or this. You have to do an emotional scene when you fall apart. Well, if I tell you a joke and it's funny, you laugh the first time. Now I'm going to tell you the same joke 15 times. Can you, where do you, where, can you, there's nothing as awful on film as false laughter. Can you touch your risibility and, and, and take the trip and, and make the joke funny again and again and again? Good actors can. And that's what cra craft is a, the ability to use your talent. And that's what the training is about. It's not about, you can't teach someone to act, but you can teach them how to act again and again and again. And, and at start at, and then you're also doing a scene, let's say, where you haven't shot the piece before it, and you haven't shot the piece afterwards. But you have to have the sense to know approximately where you are emotionally in that scene that you're going to shoot in two weeks. And that one that you may not shoot f for two months. So you've got to be able to keep all of this stuff in control of, uh, and, and have your arc clear in your head and, and understand that the, most directors don't tell you how to act. They basically tell you where to go. Woody Allen, you know, Woody Allen doesn't direct anybody. I mean, you know, he fires you if he doesn't like what you're doing. But he'll, he, how he directs is, uh, I want you to start in the kitchen, and then you can go into the bedroom, but don't stay too long because I'm not going to follow you. You can go to the window, or you can sit for a while, but I want I, you end in the kitchen. You will find your way. And he walks away, and then you rehearse it twice, and it's five pages long, and there's no coverage. And if there's a glitch, it's in the movie. So that's what you do. And you don't want a glitch in that scene. So, uh, but he, you know, he hires good actors. And then he'll tell you, he'll first want to tell you, I don't know how to talk to an actor. I, I, I expect they, they do what they do well. And uh, I haven't been directed by anybody, frankly, in like 30 years. I, I mean, I come in with stuff. I figure if they don't like it, they'll tell me. And they don't tell me, so I do it. I hit the mark, say the words, and get get the hell out afterwards. I mean, what good acting is uh, unpredictability and inevitability, ultimately. How they get there is, is I, all I want to believe ever is what's going on between those two people is happening for the first time ever. That's what a, a scene's about. I don't want to see the rehearsals. I don't want to see slickness. I, I want to see stuff going on. It's like a tennis match. You can't, if you're waiting 
on the wrong side of the court because a guy hit it there last time, the ball's going to go over there. You've got to go where the ball goes. And you play better tennis with a good player. It keeps you on your toes. And that good acting is like a good tennis game. Where the hell is the ball going to be hit next? And I don't know what you're going to ask me here until you ask me. If you ask me the last question you asked me, and I say Wednesday because I said it last time, I mean, ask me a question. Uh, what was the favorite show you were on? Wednesday. Oh, favorite, oh, uh, I'll have that for you in a minute. Uh, anyway, what I'm basically saying is I want to know, and I never say the words out loud until I get on the set because I don't want to learn the music. People ask me, can I cue you? And I say, no, thank you. I don't tell them why, but I don't want, uh, how do you do? It's nice to meet you. How do you do it? I'm, I'm stuck. You know, try and sing happy birthday in a different way. Happy birthday to you, happy birth. I want to wait till I get on the set, see where I am, and, and know what the hell's going on before I say my first words back to you. Otherwise, I'm, they're in, in my brain already. What is that? That's not good. I can't answer your question until you ask me the question. Or if you say something that I don't agree with, I'll hear it, but uh, not, I will not uh, anticipate that. Oh, expectation is a killer. Anticipation's okay in life too. Now is all that's important in acting. Now is all that's important in life. Now. You can't live in the past, you can learn from the past. And Tomorrow's a day that never comes because it's always today. Now, and I try to live in the now, and my work is about now. And once I realize that, uh, that's what I tell young actors too. I mean, it's about now and what's going on now. Uh, you know, there's no one on the other end of the telephone. Hello? Yeah, I can't now. No, <laughs> excuse me, uh, what? No, I'm, I'm doing an interview. <laughs> no, I really, I am. I'm not kidding you. No, I'm, I, this is actually me. I'm so sorry. No, I, I'm actually being photographed now. I, I pro I'll call you back. Yeah, I, half an hour, okay? Yeah. Okay. No, I can't. Right. I will call you, I promise you, as soon as I'm finished. Okay. Me too. Bye. I'm so sorry. Well, that was fun. I mean, one, one, I liked it because of, it, it was a, a deviation from the show. I mean, usually you saw the murderer and you took the trip with Columbo who had to find out how and in this instance, you see the murderer, but you wind up realizing it's not the murderer because there's two of them. And which one is the murderer? So it's a, it's a whole, it was the only one that actually was different in terms of the, of the focus of the show. It wasn't, it wasn't only how did he do it, which is what the other shows were about. How, how was the crime, you saw the crime, but how, he has to figure out how it was done. This was who did it. And they knew how it was done. The guy was electrocuted in, in his bathtub. But who did it? There were two suspects. And it turns out, you know, I don't want to give the ending away. Anyway, but, but I liked it because they were two very disparate characters. One was sort of a tight ass. Uh, businessman, and the other guy was a flamboyant uh, television cook, like, uh, uh, you know, any one of those guys, Graham, and, and, and they were very different guys, and I, I, I just thought it was fun, 
and uh, and Peter and I had a, a, a <laughs> this cooking segment which was hilarious, and we just had a lot of a lot of people felt it was totally improvised. It wasn't, though we laughed a lot and and stuff happened, but we we pretty much stuck to the script, and uh, but it's like a little one act play, and and we we both enjoyed it thoroughly, and. Uh, yeah, the character, you know, he was, but he was like a mosquito. I mean, I thought of him as as a as a fly or an insect that kept coming back and buzzing. I mean, uh, it's, my relationship to him was on that basis. He was like a, a troublesome insect that kept getting bigger, you know, and and more dangerous. Like a, a starting off as, let's say, a a mite, and then becoming a mosquito, and then becoming a bee or a hornet, and uh, that kind of attitude about a guy who's suddenly, you know, becoming more dangerous. I remember that. I played a character who thought he was part horse. Uh, yeah, the boys want to buy a big white stallion for their father's birthday, and and Mike Landon goes down into Mexico and is going to bring this big, handsome white horse back, and I come with the horse. I want to make sure that horse lives. And uh, I thought my character actually, there were some lines that they cut because they felt that we, people wouldn't take them. But my mother, uh, there was a, a speech that was in the original script that I'm sorry they took out, but my mother ran out of milk when I was an infant and she held me up to a mare. And my character thinks she's part horse. And, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to do it. And there was something, Amalien, Amal, I forget, I think that was his name, Amalien, anyway. And uh, he dies saving Mike Landon and the horse. And I died up. As opposed to down, I felt the guy was. If, uh, I felt the guy wasn't ready to die, and, and so I, I died coming forward as a fall backwards. And uh, Comanchero, you know, he was. A, I would never be cast in that role today. It would be politically incorrect. Uh, but I played, you know, uh, Chiricahua Apaches and all kinds of stuff. And today, I. Uh, if a Mexican actor didn't play that part, it, it, you know, there'd be pickets. Uh, but I, uh, also in Big Valley, I played a Mexican. You know, I played all kinds of things without people complaining. Uh, Blue-eyed Indians and so on. Uh, no, I mean, on one, one hand, I, I understand it because, I mean, ethnic actors uh, uh, need work. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm a big believer in the best person for the job, doing the job. I mean, you can't play, doesn't matter what you are in the major leagues, if you hit 350, that's what should determine who plays baseball. And that's what does determine who plays baseball. You can be purple, or, but, and that doesn't, correspond to the theater. I mean, shouldn't the best person for the job get the job? By the same token, if I were a, a, a Mexican actor, I would be furious if a Caucasian played a, a role that I was right for. So that's not an easy answer. I understand it from both sides. and and. and both arguments are valid, is what I'm saying. I mean, I, if you know, if I was a black person, I would, I, uh, and they cast a white person in that role because they just said, oh, why, why not? I would be, I'd be the first one out there with with a with a sign. So I, I mean, I see it from both sides, and I. By the same token, you know, there were a lot of wonderful actors who are not up working. Uh, if you come from Australia or Britain, you have a much better chance of getting on an American television show than you are if you're born here. 
because it's something casting exotic, uh, directors are, are, are seduced by th those accents and mesmerized by them. You can't work in England if you're an American. You can only get a work permit for a certain amount of time. Even Broadway shows can only work for four weeks. I mean, a, a Broadway musical that goes to London, the original cast can only work for four weeks before they replace it with an all-British cast. A British show can come to this country and play indefinitely. They protect the British equity actors are protected. Uh, actors, equity actors are not. I mean, I, I'm getting into political areas, but, but the bottom line is there are wonderful actors that I know who are losing roles to actors that are not as good who happen to, to you know, to put shrimp in the bobby. It was reflective of what went on. It wasn't gratuitous violence. You're talking about the Chicago mobs, and those guys, uh, I mean, they, you know, if you look at the Prohibition days, I mean, the protection, when I grew up with, in Brooklyn with the Murder Incorporated sons and daughters, Garage Shapiro and Louis Lepke's kids, uh, that Thomas Dewey cleaned up and as district attorney became governor and ran for president. Uh, Garage Shapiro, he was named Garah because he couldn't say get out of here, which was his favorite word. He said, Garah. And uh, uh, those guys, I mean, if, if you stood in their way, uh, they got rid of you. So, I mean, historically, the, the, that, that was pretty much, you know, w Westerns also have a lot of violence, but there was a lot of violence. The law didn't. Uh, I mean, how do you uphold the law when there ain't no law? <laughs> I, did a, I did the second one ever done and the third one aired, Western with Dan Durier. Yeah, and then I did one of the last ones uh, that Dick Donner directed with John Van Drieglen where I played a, a character who's in a hotel room with a booby trap somewhere and I got to find it. Yes? How was Rod Serling different in those two? He was very different. Talk about that. Well, the first time we actually sat around a table, it was brand new at, uh, at the MGM lot, now the Sony lot, uh, on the back lot on the Western Street and at a table and read the piece and he made little changes out of the reading. It was the way live television was done, you'd sit and read. And then and that, that afternoon we'd get up on our feet and do it. Uh, and he was gung-ho. It was, as I say, the second one ever shot third one aired. And then the, in 1964, I did one of the last ones. And uh, he was there because they whip pan. He didn't have to be, but he was. They'd whip pan from the hotel room to the uh, middle ground with a brick wall. And he was actually there doing those breaks. And we talked at the time, and he was very disillusioned with the ad agencies and the, and the censors and the people telling him well, that's not a good uh, idea, and and it was before he went to Universal and did the uh, that other series after you know, but, but he needed a little time off, and uh, he w he was not happy with the fact that he had to go through so many layers to get what he wanted on the air. In the beginning, uh, it was easier, and he. He pretty much had a free reign. And then as things went on and, you know, more and more uh, people became involved, uh, it, it, he didn't enjoy it as much. He had to go through too many hoops before he got an okay to even do a show. And that disillusioned him quite a bit. He was somewhat down on television at that point, you know, and, and series television. And then, he, what's the other series he did over after that? Pardon me? Night Gallery. Night Gallery, which was a similar texture show. And, uh, and I think he, you know, missed it and went again. And I think he ran into, the, you know, much of the same stuff 
But there was a, a, a change between the show I did in 1959 and the show I did in 1964 in him. And over the years, too, there were a couple of panels I sat on with him, one at UCLA with a writer there, you know, and, and uh, I, I saw changes in him at those, you know, in, in terms of his feeling about television and his feeling about the bureaucracy, you know, assistants had more assistance, so had more assistance, and, and the buck didn't stop anywhere that one could notice or recognize, and, and, and when that started happening, it was like, who do I talk to, you know? Uh, continuity acceptance, you know, what you don't, you know, there were a number of obstacles that weren't there in the beginning. The good thing about working with someone like Robert is you don't get hurt doing that because he's in control. I mean, I have been hit by actors and a couple of inept stunt people over the years and actually been knocked unconscious and kicked in the head. Uh, so working with Robert was a pleasure because as we worked out the choreography, it was, you know, precisionally done and no one got hurt. Uh, there were times, you know, I won't mention some of the actors' names, but where I really didn't look forward to those sequences. One very well-known actor was drinking uh, vodka out of a 7-Up bottle all afternoon, and we had a fight sequence, and man, I mean, I'm lucky to be alive. Uh, I mean, so I mean, Robert was a joy to work with. I mean, in that in that sense, <coughs> the fight sequence looked good, and no one got hurt, and that's that's what you want. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, I don't want to lose a bunch of teeth doing a sequence, you know, I got to work the next day. No, I can't smile. No, no, I can't smile. <laughs> anyway, so, so uh, the virtues of working with somebody uh, who was really good at it. Uh, in Mission Impossible, I did a, a fight sequence in a warehouse in a show called A Spool There Was with Warren Vanders, who was light heavyweight champion of the United States Army at uh, one point, and we did m much of it ourselves with crowbars and barrels and stuff. In, it's a long fight sequence, and uh, I'd say th more than three quarters of it were, were the two of us. And I trusted him, and he trusted me. So, you know, I mean, with crowbars, I mean, you swing and duck, and, and swing again and duck. Uh, you don't want to get hit with one of those. Uh, and pushing barrels down, and uh, you know. And, and uh, again, I trusted him, and he tried, and it, 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 no one got hurt. You know, you can get hurt. There was a stuntman on, on another Mission Impossible I did, actually the same show. He said, "Just grab my arm and I'll do it. I'll do a flip." Well, I grabbed his arm and boom, he, he the guy weighed about 300 pounds too, and he kicked me in the head, and I went down, and I couldn't use it because my character flips him and then has to run off and not lie down on the ground, hearing birds. Uh, I said, Charlie Rondeau is directing, and I, he, I said, you know, hey, that's not good. You know, when I finally kind of, uh, we did a second take, and the guy said, don't worry, I'm sorry about that, and he kicked me again. And I was out, completely out cold. And I said, I'm not going to do it again. Change the camera angle and get someone else. I mean, this guy is not very good at this. He's good at kicking me in the head, but that's, and uh, I said, I don't want to do it a third time because, you know, I, I, he's perfect at this. It, he matches it perfectly, but I can't run out of the scene after this. So I, they shot it from behind with a, with a stuntman and not me. I, you know, I said, I, you know, this, is, I, I, this is crazy. The guy telling me he'll do the rest. Well, he's, maybe he has something against me. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, he hated me. He figured if he knocked me out, he'd get my job. Anyway, and riding horses too. 
which unfortunately I could do, because I even growing up in Brooklyn, I rode horses. We used to go up to the Adirondacks and ride horses and swimming, swim horses in the Hudson. And you know, some don't swim; they sink. You don't know it until you get. I mean, literally, the horses. Most horses swim because they run in the water, but the occasional horse just doesn't do that instinctively and, and goes down and drowns. So you never know it <laughs> until you do it. But that's one in several hundred. Uh, you, you always had a little trepidation when you tried to cross a river with a horse. You put the stirrups on the pommel, you put your knees up and and wait until it, the horse, you know, will the horse sink or swim? I mean, literally, which is a fascinating uh, exercise. You know, you know, Greg Morris, I mean, uh, and when sometimes we get notes from up top saying, Barbara's makeup and Greg's makeup are so disparate. Hers is so pale and his is, they shouldn't be that close together. Now, that makeup excuse was not what it was about. It was about putting some between. They were too close together on the screen. And uh, so we'd managed to get them together in that apartment scene all the time, as much as we could. <laughs> Greg was a, a terrifically talented actor and a wonderful guy as a person. Why was, shouldn't this character have those elements, and why shouldn't they be out there? Uh, as opposed to Step and Fetch It, who was one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood, and, you know, or Willie Best. Uh, both of those guys were very bright men and never played a bright man. So, I mean, is, is that good? I think it's better the other way around. <laughs> I mean, I'm an actor, and if I like something, I do it. If it moves me, affects me, I see, you know. Other times when I needed money, I did the best of the worst that was offered me, uh, that didn't embarrass me, or, or was, wasn't diametric to what I believe as a human being. Uh, but then I, you know, from time to time I get a script that was wonderful. And you know, but you know, you don't get those all the time. Uh, they're not written all the time. So, I mean, I've been very fortunate in, in playing some very interesting and, and difficult roles in a certain sense. And, I like that. The more layers and more complication, the better I am, because I, I like to thicken the soup. Uh, you know, good bulgur base, you know, with a lot of stuff that, you know, you keep adding elements that make the soup better. Uh, then, you know, then I, there was a period, too, where I played, you know, bad guys who were vi villains by profession. I mean, I don't know anyone like that. I'm a, I'm a professional bad guy. I wake up in the morning and say, who am I going to screw today? I mean, who can I hurt? You know, I mean, those are cartoons with real characters, you know. And, and there's a period, you know, when you're doing certain kinds of television shows where you're, they're written that way. And, and if you complicate them too much, it become indulgent. I mean, it's, you're right, you know, it's like the wrong soup. You know, it's a split pea soup. Don't put noodles in it. Uh, uh, that's, I guess that's a good analogy. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I've been very lucky and fortunate in that I've been working for a long time in a variety of roles and movies great directors. I mean, I've worked with Hitchcock and George Stevens and Joe Mankiewicz and more recently with Tim Burton, Francis Coppola, uh, you know, really Woody Allen. I mean, 
I've been very f fortunate uh, at some pictures that you know you can see several times and not because they have a lot of fireballs and, and uh, car chases and characters climbing up the sides of buildings, but because you get something new from them if you see it again a year later uh, and you can talk about them for a while. And those are interesting movies. Uh, Crimes and Misdemeanors, I know people who go back and see it every couple of years and say, you know, I saw something in that that I never saw before. Or it made me think, you know, and, and uh, that's good. I'm, I'm you know, uh, keeping, and keeping all the media uh, open to my, me, you know, and not when I did films, you know, to, to turn my back on television or, uh, no, why? Though I, these days I don't do much television by choice because I, I don't for a lot of reasons. But, I, but I'm, I'm doing, you know, some independent films, some studio, you know, I'm, I'm still working and enjoying it. And, uh, and if I don't like something, I don't do it. And that's good. I sometimes get a script written by a farmer with a rake. And uh, I can say, I, you know, and I'm amazed, you know, in, in not doing it. But then I see it on the, uh, you know, advertised. I, How the hell did they get this movie made? I'm like, God. But uh, it's all good, and I, I still enjoy it.